Okay, I uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining this seminar. I'm going to talk about um, global demographic change and the international capital flows. Um, a broader motivation of this project is to look at the international aspects of uh, population aging. There are a lot of uh, economic studies on population aging in closed economies, but much less in open economic context. So this paper is to uh, explore the um, our international aspects or in, a, in a theoretical model, and then provide uh, an intense extensive literature review. All right, um, here's my plan for this talk. So first I will talk about why I am interested in the international dimension of population aging. Then I will introduce my model and um, in a small open economy, based on the model, I will look at the demographic effects uh, on capital flows. So this will serve as uh, the benchmark results when I do the, do the literature review. I divide, and then I divide the literature uh, into, two, into two parts, modeling studies and empirical studies. Um, given this paper covers a lot of contents, I will skip many details in the presentation due to the time constraint, but I will focus on big picture. Uh, feel free to interrupt um, if you have any questions when I move forward. First, why am I interested in the international dimension of population, population aging? I will present two effects and two theories. The first effect is about um, global demographic change, given most of us are affiliated with uh, CEPA, we are aware that um, population is aging almost everywhere. So this is uh, driving by declining uh, fertility and increasing longevity due to decreasing mortality. So the two graphs two graph present total fertility rates and life expectancy by region since uh, World War II. We can easily observe the long-run long -run patterns. Although the world shares the similar long-run long -run trend, regions and countries are, are significantly asymmetric in the timing of, and speed of this uh, demographic transitions, particularly between advanced and developing countries. So in this, in this graph, this is the world average, and this is Africa, and this, uh, the, the dotted line is uh, represent uh, Latin America, and this green one is uh, Asia, and this is uh, Oceania, and this one is uh, North America, and the bottom one is uh, with Europe. All right, uh, the combination of this declining fertility and increasing longevity uh, has substantially changed age structure. So these two graphs pre present the youth dependence ratio and the elderly dependence ratio respectively. Um, population has been aging in most regions and is expected to age more rapidly uh, in the next several decades. But there is also large heterogeneity across the regions. Just wanted to highlight that uh, the youth dependency, the youth dependent ratio increased quickly during the time period. So the generation born in the two decades after World War II are often called the baby boom generations. And in this graph, you can see that uh, the elderly dependent ratio increase, uh, is increasing quickly all around this time period. This is because the baby boom generation are reaching 65 years old and they are retiring now. So it is important to keep the baby boom generation in mind when we discuss uh, results later. Okay, um, the second effect is about um, our global current count in imbalances. In case someone doesn't know the current count, it is a broader measure of international trade. So the two graphs present current count balances of five major economies in the last half century. Uh, this one is in level, and this one is uh, in terms of uh, GDP. So five countries, so th this one, it represents the United States, and this dotted one is the United Kingdom, and this one is, uh, is China, and this uh, uh, orange one represents uh, Germany, and this uh, green one is uh, Japan. So this indicates that uh, uh, the current kind of imbalances have increased, have increased persistently since 90, 90, 1980s. Particularly North America has run persistent deficits and Asia, especially China and Japan has run large surpluses. So what's the problem of uh, global imbalances? The persistent imbalances have raised the concerns about long-term financial stability and resilience. If one country runs a persistent deficit, this means that um, it borrows a lot of financial capital from the world, from the world, which often puts this economy in the risk of uh, 
potential currency and financial crisis induced by sudden capital floods. And in addition, global imbalances were also a political driver of the trade wars between the United States and other countries, especially China. So the imbalances have stimulated extensive academic and policy debate, especially after the global financial crisis in 2008. And there is um, uh, an emerging literature that links uh, the global demo demographic change to the global imbalances. To understand the link, uh, we need two theories. One theory is about, is about what drives the international capital flow in general. I follow this uh, real interest rate parity, which says the real interest rate adjusted by country risk and expected the change of the real exchange rate tended to be equal across countries unless there are capital controls, all right? So um, empirical evidence supports that the real interest rate parity holds uh, uh, very well in the long run. So this is a, a good starting point. Um, if, um, if we assume the real interest rate remains unchanged under some, under some assumptions, and this condition or uh, the parity reduced to uh, become even simpler like this. So this says the real interest rate adjusted by country risk tended to be equal across countries. So this is quite intuitive because of uh, arbitrage forces in, in capital markets. The second theory is about why demographic change can drive uh, capital flows. The life cycle hypothesis indicated that the people tended to smooth their consumption over time, but they often have this uh, hump-shaped income profiles over life cycle. So this implies that people tended to borrow when they are young and save when they are prime workers, and they did say when they're retired, all right? So this uh, borrowing and saving behavior are exactly the potential drivers of capital flows. And this paper aims to uh, provide a review of the demographic studies on international capital flows. Many factors can drive uh, capital flows across countries, especially in the short term. Uh, this project focuses on demographic change, which uh, uh, contributed to medium and long-term low frequency capital flows because demo demographic change is a long-term low frequency process, all right? And the literature falls into two broader uh, strands you know, from a time perspective. One strand projects uh, the impacts of a future demographic change and hypothetical pension reforms. So this strand of study can illustrate how future demographic change shapes the landscape of the world economy and also provide guidance for future pension uh, policies. The other strands focus on historic current county imbalances and they include demographics as, as an explanatory factor or focus on demographics alone and then estimate how much demographic change contributes to historic global imbalances. All right, I hope this provides sufficient background uh, of this topic. So my contribution of this project are threefold. First, I build up a theoretical model with uh, uh, analytic solutions, which, uh, which is my favorite part of, this, uh, of this, uh, this paper. And then I do a detailed analysis of uh, demographic shocks and also conduct um, uh, a comprehensive uh, literature review. Uh, now I'll briefly sketch the model without going into too much detail. Uh, the basic idea is to introduce demographic structure and a pension system into a small open economy model and then obtain or an analytic solution to the current count balance. The time is uh, discrete and infinite in this model. I consider a small open economy which takes um, the real uh, the world interest rate, rate as given. Uh, I assume a single commodity good in the world. So I abstract from um, uh, real exchange rate, abstract from, from the term of the trade, abstract from uh, economic structure. And I assume there is a perfect international bond market so people can freely borrow and lend abroad with, 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 without frictions. And also a perfect domestic capital market, a perfect international goods market, a perfect domestic labor market. A labor is not mobile across countries. And I assume there is a balanced uh, pay-as-you-go or pension system, which is financed by labor income taxes. And there are no other general uh, generic uh, or government taxes in the model. Um, assume all agents have a perfect foresight, so there is no uncertainty. 
except that household face a mortality risk when they are when they are getting old. And um, I also assume a per, there is a perfect annuity market, so household can make arrangements to ensure away the risk of un, unintended bequests. And the word interest rate is, uh, is constant at R. All right, now um, demographics. Uh, a new generation is born each period without set asset. So this is side of the new new generation, and this is small and t is uh, the the fertility rate. And if nt equals one, then the population size is stationary. So this is nt equals one represents the re replacement level. And individuals live up to two periods. They 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 work when they are young, and they retire when they are old. And a young individual in period T survive into retirement with uh, a probability of uh, PT plus one. So this is a survival probability equivalently. So the mortality rate is one minus uh, PT plus one. And the side of each older generation is just uh, uh, evolved from the, this uh, young generation and based on this uh, survival probability. And I assume the survival probability increased over time and equivalently. Uh, the, Mortality rate decrease over time. Larry, right. can yeah. I ask a question, please? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so because you have this literature review, so I'm just wondering, is your model picking up features of other models? So are you trying to compare the results from other studies within your framework? Um, yeah, that's right. I, I have a huge literature review section later. Yeah, but is it integrated in your modeling? So does, is your model similar to other models? Or is your model even more general and you are, can replicate the results of other models? Or is the literature review just a separate like section in your paper? Or do you actually try to analyze these other studies within your framework? Yeah, they are closely linked. Yeah. So how is your model different from other studies? Can you comment on that? Um, or similar? Pretty, yeah, probably. Uh... I will show you, I'll show you in, a, in a minute when I get the, when I get the, the solution to the current kind of balance. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. So just to confirm, so Larry's just setting up an analytical framework over which he can then use the literatures that he's reviewed to understand from this theoretical framework what the other studies are doing. Okay. So I think we'll continue on, Larry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is demographics. So there is a pay as you go pension system and which is financed by taxing labor income at uh, tau t and um, and all individuals receive pay pension benefits based on the previous wage and also the replacement rate um the, the system runs the balance budget uh, each period so this links uh, the, the tax rate and the replacement rate uh, of course if the replacement rate is zero the system becomes completely prefunded pre um, consumers, each young individual inelastically supply one unit of labor. So individuals can invest foreign assets and domestic capital. And as I said, there is a perfect annuity market which ensures away unintended uh, bequest. So we can easily write down the period budget constraints for the our young generation and also older generation. So, and then we can further derive the uh, in the temporary budget constraint. And um, so, the so individual's uh, lifetime income includes uh, labor income when they're young and also pension income when they're, when they're old, all right? Subject to this uh, in the temporary budget constraint, this individual uh, uh, makes uh, a consumption plan to, uh, to maximize lifetime utility. Uh, so there's a quite standard, this uh, sigma represents the elasticity of in the temporary substitution and the beta is a subjective discount factor which measures uh, the patience of of uh, of, consent, of consumer and this PT plus one is uh, the survival probability. All right, now we can uh, solve the optimal consumption pass and and also the saving of the young individual, the saving of the old individual. On the production side, there is an aggregate production set. A representative firm use uh, capital and labor to produce output following this. Uh, Copy down the utility uh, uh, production function. This is capital, labor, and output. And this AT represents the uh, total or factor productivity. Um, so, or TFP, and, and uh, same TFP rise over time. So, this is small g represents uh, the 
growth rate of labor uh, productivity growth. And capital accumulated through investment without depreciation. All right, um, the firm maximizes uh, the present value of uh, uh, entire profits, and we can easily derive the first order conditions. And as normal, we can derive, we can define our uh, recursive equilibrium. So I'll skip this. If we combine all these equilibrium conditions, we can uh, solve this uh, capital labor ratio and the wage rate. They are determined by the world interest rate and this, and also the TLP level. So this is a uh, quite standard in uh, in a small open economy model. All right. Given this individual saving, we can derive the national saving, which consists of uh, the saving of the each young generation and the saving of each older generation. All right, then, so, and then we put them together, we get this uh, uh, national saving. And now that I'm interested in, in saving in terms, of, uh, in terms of output, rather than saving in level, because it's a more informative indicator. Uh, similarly, we can uh, derive this, uh, Investment in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, output. Okay. Finally, uh, we can obtain the the current count, which reflects the, the difference between national saving and investment. So this is um so this is an analytic solution to the current count in this small open economy. This is my favorite part of this uh, of this uh, paper. So back to the uh, the previous question, someone asked. So this is a uh, this is my contribution to the to the literature to the to the whole literature, not just uh, do the literature review. Yeah. And this equation links a large number of, uh, of factors to the current count uh, analytically. So I reviewed about one hundred papers in this project and was not satisfied about the transparency of uh, of the link between the demographics and the current count. So I decided to write down this this model. And a small open economy that that takes the world interest rate as given allows the existence of analytic solutions. So let's look at a little bit more detail here. So uh, the current count depends on, or uh, look at the fertility first, depends on the, the past uh, fertility, nt minus one, and it also depends on the current fertility, nt and nt, and also future fertility, or uh, nt plus one here. And similarly, the current count depends on the, the past, current, and the future mortality rates, and also the past, current, and the future pension replacement replacement rate, and also the past, current, future productivity growth rates, and also the elasticity of, of in the temporal substitution in consumption, which is uh, sigma here, and also the elasticity of output with respect to capital and labor in production, which is R for here, and also the world interest rate, R, and the subjective counter factor, R, beta. So I think this is, a, this is quite a, uh, this is beautiful here. And, um, uh, this, and of course, this is very complicated, and there are many mechanisms. Uh, now, let's uh, get some intuition of this complex uh, uh, expression by disentangling uh, different factors. Uh, in the paper, I, I have considered the effect of demographic change alone, uh, and also the interaction between productivity growth and demographic change, and also the interaction between pension system and demographic change, and also the effects of foreign demographic change through the channel of change in the world interest rate. So due to time constraint here, I only look at some, uh, some of the scenarios to provide some insights. Uh, first, let's uh, focus on demographic change alone. So assuming TLP is constant and there is no pension system. So the current count uh, reduced to this expression. So you can see that uh, our now uh, it, 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 the current fertility here, the future uh, fertility here. So you can see that the current count are increase uh, in current uh, fertility because I calculate uh, uh, the current count in terms of the output. This is the saving of the older generation, older generation which depends on the, the previous output. So the saving output ratio is scaled by the change of output. And uh, it decreases uh, in, the, in the future fertility because the fertility growth determines investment. So the current count also depends on or uh, depends on the on the current um, mortality, or the survival rate. But we can uh, equivalent we can think of this as mortality rate. So the current count depends on uh, current mortality and also future mortality. All right, but mortality only affects uh, national saving, uh, and does not affect uh, our investment. All right. 
Now, let's um, uh, suppose that fertility and mortality accounts in the anterior period, period S, and the demographic shocks occur in period S2 plus one. And then we will see what will happen if we uh, uh, if shocks occur. Let's, let's, think, uh, let's look at a few, a few shocks. The first one, suppose uh, fertility increased for one period and then return to one. So in this case, total population increased for one uh, increase in this period and then flattens, all right? So this is a temporary fertility shock with permanent change in population size, okay? So in this shock, capital, capital flows in, um, flows in at the end of period S to finance the investment for the, for the additional young individual born in period S T plus one. So this is why current count in the first period is in deficit. At the end of the period S T plus one, the individual young individuals save part of their labor income for retirement. So the part of the part of the foreign capital will flow out. This is why this is in surplus in the, in, the, in the next period. And after the other current count, it's a uh, return to balance and the economy uh, accumulated external, external foreign debt. This first case is a temporary fertility shock with permanent change in population size. Uh, the second one is uh, slightly different. Suppose uh, fertility increased for one period and then decreased below one, such that the size of a young generation remains at the pre-shock pre level and then return to, to one afterwards. So in this case, Total population increased for two periods and then decreased to the pre-shock level afterwards. So I call this a, a temporary fertility shock with a temporary change in the population size. In the previous case, it was a, a permanent change in population size. In this case, it is a temporary change in population size. All right, in this case, um, in this case, capital flows in at the end of the period S to finance the investment for the additional young individuals as before. And at the end of the period S T plus one, the investment decreased because labor force decreased to the pre-shock level. So the foreign capital completely flows out. So the current count returned to balance afterwards. So the foreign asset position uh, returned to zero. So which is different from the, the first case. Uh, the third one, um, suppose the fertility change permanently and remains at a constant level forever. So total, in this case, total population either expands or shrinks, depends on the fertility level. It's uh, larger than one or smaller than one. So if fertility increase, then capital flows in continuously and the foreign asset position decreases continuously. If fertility decreases, capital flows out in persistently and the foreign asset position incre increase uh, continuously. So this is a, uh, a permanent fertility shock with persistent change in population size. Then we look at uh, a mortality shock. Suppose mortality uh, decreased uh, uh, for one period and then flattens forever. So in this case, the young generation remains stable and the older generation increased permanently because this uh, mortality decreased. So total population increased permanently. Um, in this case, capital flows out in the first period because the young generation saves more even more people survive into, into re retirement and accumulate constant foreign assets. And if uh, mortality keeps, keeps decreasing, then capital flows out continuously and foreign assets uh, increase uh, continuously. Uh, to, summarize, uh, to summarize here, fertility affects both inv investment and saving, but the effect on investment dominates and mortality only affects uh, saving. And the effects of a temporary, permanent, and persistent fertility shocks differ from each other. For temporary fertility shocks, the initial pattern of capital flows would be reversed later on, because you can see that capital flows, in and, uh, flows back and forth uh, in and out. All right, let's, let's uh, introduce uh, productive, productive growth. So this uh, current count will be like this. There is no pension, pension system here. And uh, so our productive growth rate GT here and the GT plus one here. So you can see that um, our, the current count increase in current um, productive growth. This is because, um, because uh, productive growth decrease the ratio of uh, all the disk saving to the current count. Again, this is because uh, this is also 
the row of the GT is, is just like the row of NT, as I explained above. And for this, uh, the current count is a decrease in the in future productivity growth because the future productivity productivity growth increase investment. And another insight here is that um, um, so we we can see that uh, this GT and NT they appear together, right? If we rewrite NT GT like this, so this NT is a fertility rate, GT is a growth rate of productivity growth rate of uh, labor. Our productive growth. So we write it this. So this suggests that the current count depends on labor growth and productivity growth separately and also interactively. All right. Um, another point is that um, productive growth normally attracts capital inflows, which can partly offset the effect of uh, fertility decline. Just because of their this uh, this uh, interactive effect. Uh, let's now introduce the pension systems. So we get this uh, current count, the current count expression here, and uh, the pension system is characterized by the uh, replacement rate rho t here, rho t plus one, and rho t minus mi minus one, rho t rho t here. So pension system, you can see that a pension system affects only National saving, not investment, right? And um, there are a number of uh, mechanisms here. It's complicated here. So, but the first point is that um, to you can see that replacing the row T always interact with, uh, with the mortality rate or survival rate, I should say. All right. So the first point, and then I will show you show one scenario about the pension reform. Suppose the demographic structure is stable. This is demographic is stable. And there is no there is no productive growth, and now let's so we cut pension benefits by reducing the replacement replacement rate. So in this case, um, capital flows out in 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 this period because the older generation did save less because they have they have a, a lower pension benefits, and the capital flows out further in the next period because the young generation saves more because they expect uh, less pension benefits. And after that, after that the current count return to balance. And so this economy will accumulate uh, foreign assets from, in the, from the first two periods. And uh, this example illu illustrated that a policy reform towards more funded pension system increased the national saving and the drives capital outflows. And the lower the replacement, replacement rate, the higher the saving rate. And I also have several, uh, several cases which illustrated the interaction, interaction between uh, demographic shocks and pension systems, but I don't have time to, 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 show, to present them, so I'll skip them. And also this is uh, illustrated how uh, the foreign demographic change or affect the current count, current count balances. So I summarize this part in this in this table. So current count imbalances can be temporary or permanent. The foreign assets position can be can be temporary, permanent, or persistent, depending on the demographic drivers and the shock persistence. And the productive growth interact with the fertility, fertility change and the pension system interact with mortality change. Okay, with this background, with this benchmark uh, model in mind, we now move to the literature. I organize the literature into a number of uh, groups from a modeling perspective, starting with uh, the studies uh, of uh, basic demographics and then and followed by the study of introducing uh, complex uh, demographic issues. Um, and uh, the paper also covers some of uh, these this issues, but I'm not going to talk about them uh, in the presentation. Uh, uh, by the way, I didn't include any references because there are around 100 references and it's hard to manage in slides. So uh, first uh, I will go through uh, this, uh, some modern, strat modern strategies and then focus on this, uh, these issues. Uh, there are four uh, broad approach is to introducing demographic structure into general equilibrium models. And this first one is the older or OLG model, so which is 
or I, I do in the in, in my model. So this is a, it's the most common one. And um, the paper contains some technical details about this uh, about this uh, approach, different approaches. To what extent the modeling approaches affect the macro impacts of demography change, both qualitatively and quantitatively, um, is not clear to me. And I think it's this uh, merit uh, systemat systemat systematic uh, examination. And the modeling studies investigate um, uh, a variety of demographic shocks over different time periods for different countries and regions. The demographic shocks can be driven by fertility change or mortality change or both. The shocks can be uh, temporary, permanent, or persistent. And demographic shocks also take much longer time compared to other shocks in macroeconomics, such as physical policy, monetary, monetary shock, protective shock, and oil shocks. And for example, the transitory fertility shock after World War II took several decades to phase out. And the impact still continue today because the baby boom generation are retiring over the period of 2010 to 2030. And also different shocks have, have, have um, different impacts on population size in both short, in both short and long run, which it, well, we have uh, observed in our, in our, our first two scenarios. To examine the effects of demographic shocks on, in open economies, uh, there are, are a baseline scenario or a kind of active scenario or a reference scenario must be chosen, whatever you like to call it, must be chosen. There are four uh, broad strategies in the literature. I will skip the details here. Okay, this part I connect the uh, started without a pension system and a child support. So I call it, this is the basic or demo demographics. And this the literature suggests that uh, the effects uh, the demographic effects on, on international capital flows depend on the drivers of demographic shocks. And we, we, we have already seen that. Um, the effects also depend on the stage of uh, demographic shocks. So uh, we, also, we also observe this, capital flows, uh, flows uh, in and out. And some st studies suggest the effect can be quantitatively large. So closed economy models are likely to miss quantitatively important effects. And there is a broader consensus that um, the demographic differences can well explain the low frequency capital flows, such as five year average or 10 year average uh, between the OECD countries over the last quarter of the uh, last century, especially our, with our, the United States, the United States on one, one side, between the United States on, on the one side and Japan and Europe on the other side. And in terms of the welfare, the negative impact of, on income and consumption are cushioned because capital outflows can partially offset the reduction of rate of return on capital that would, occur, would otherwise occur in closed economies. And although the equilibrium in open uh, economies is globally efficient, there are distribution effects uh, within individual economies, particularly between workers and capital owners. All right, um, the study without child support and pension system missed the dependency effects on the consumption side. Now it has becoming more common to incorporate uh, pension system in, in general economic models, given they play an important role in financing uh, retirement and consumption in many countries. Uh, the literature suggests that alternative ways of operating pension systems and managing pension related public data can have substantially different impacts on, on international capital flows. Uh, there are five broader ways uh, of uh, operating uh, pension systems. I'm not going into detail. I organized the started into five groups, depending, depending on the design of uh, economic environment and uh, demographic scenarios. For them, some studies assume or uh, uh, build small open economy models, just uh, as I do. And some studies assume identical countries, identical demographic shocks, but asymmetric pension systems. Some studies assume identical countries and identical pension systems, but asymmetric demographic shocks. And some studies allow countries, pensions, and demographics to be all asymmetric, uh, which are calibrated to real economies and then do simulations. Uh, some studies consider uh, asymmetric and uh, coordinated physical uh, pension reforms and physical policies. So this is, a, uh, this is about uh, policy coordination at the international level. All right, um, the insights I connected from this uh, strand of literature include capital flows from rapidly aging countries to other OECD countries are initially substantial, but the trends will be reversed when the boom, when the baby boom generation uh, retired and decumulated their savings. And um, 
countries with poor pension tend to save more for retirement and drive capital outflows. So this helps to explain capital flows from emerging to advanced economies because in the last several decades, because the emerging economies tended to have a low pens pension generosity. And the different pension policies can have significant different impacts. Uh, pension reform towards more private funding tended to increase national saving and drive capital outflows. So this is uh, related to our, our the, the, the finding in our theoretic model. And a coordinated action in physical consolidation decreases the uh, reinterest rate much more than unilateral action, so which can boost the investment and economic growth to a larger extent. Uh, most models, more than started, assume new generations are born as workers, uh, ignoring childhood. So this, the but the some uh, some argue that uh, the implication of youth dependency for consumption and saving can generate a significant uh, effects on external balances. For example, a large fertility decline include, uh, induces higher saving, part of which goes into, into foreign assets. Uh, most early studies focus on advanced economies and have paid, paid a little attention to developing economies. But the analysis of global dimensions of demographic change should consider the interaction between advanced and uh, developing economies. Uh, because uh, the advanced economy have been aging faster than developing countries. So this demographic divergence uh, could stimulate capital flows from OECD countries to, uh, to emerging economies. Most studies that include uh, developing economies assume complete capital mobility between the two groups of countries. And we know that this assumption is far away from reality, but the studies are still useful because uh, they illustrate the potential gains of, uh, of free capital flows in the context of uh, demographic change. So there are three, three groups of studies from a ge geographic perspective. The first group consider are, are only two aggregate regions, such as advanced and developing regions. And the second group select a set of uh, specific countries, including our major economies. And a third group include the entire world economy and divide the world economy into a set of uh, countries and regions. All right. Um, with complete um, uh, capital mobility, the pattern uh, of capital flows between advanced and developing economies is just a natural extension of the pattern between advanced economies driven by the baby boom generations. So um, a, broader story, a, a broader story is that um, at the end of the last century, the retirement saving by aging, aging baby boomers would raise capital supply substantially about investment in Europe, Japan, and North America. So, which uh, are so cap so that this, this regions would export capital to emerging to emerging Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And then around a period of two. Uh, 2010 to 2030, baby boomers would, decumulate, would, would retire and decumulate their savings for retirement. So this, they will uh, import capital, capital flows back to these regions. And as the largest emerging economy, China has drawn a uh, significant attention. And some argue that China's rapid increase in life expectancy, coupled with uh, low pension generosity, helps explain China's uh, high saving rate, persistent trade surpluses, and large net foreign assets. Larry, excuse me, you've got about 10 minutes left before we have questions. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. I think uh, I can manage that. Uh, capital flows between advanced, advanced or, uh, econ from advanced economy to uh, developing countries would be, would be beneficial for both groups. And um, one fundamental difference between the two groups of countries is that the capital per worker in developing countries is much lower than in advanced uh, Economy. So capital flows can accelerate capital deepening and boost the economic growth in developing countries. On the other hand, advanced countries can enjoy higher rates of return on capital. So economic openness and financial globalization are, are good in this sense. However, the developing economy may not be able to absorb substantial capital because uh, there is a huge uh, investment risk in developing economies and also developing countries will also be are experiencing a similar aging process. 
soon. And uh, now baby boom generations in advanced economy are also retiring and have started to consume their savings. All right, um, most studies assume a financial uh, assume financial capital is fully fully mobile and um, labor is completely immobile. So this assumption doesn't stand up, uh, some argue that this assumption doesn't stand, uh, stand up well in comparison with the reality, which is true, of course. And um, the magnitude, we know that the magnitude of financial, of financial capital flows, of course, depends on, crucially depends on financial openness. Although there are a global financial market have been increasingly integrated, the market are still far away from perfect. Some studies compare scenarios of cap of uh, autarkic versus open economies. So this can illustrate um, or illustrate how much how much uh, the difference how much is the difference between the capital in the two scenarios. Of course, but but the problem is that this yes or no distinction is not enough for for quantify quantifying the magnitude. In terms of labor mobility, um, several studies show that the economic impacts of uh, realistic Im immigration are small. And also, but, but a massive immigration uh, is subjected to political constraints. So in my view, it is reasonable to assume, the, assume complete labor immobility across countries for modeling our convenience. And some studies also, some studies also discuss this uh, goods or the mobility of good uh, consumption and capital goods. Let's skip the details here. And related to capital mobility, and an emerging literature emphasize that emphasize the financial friction as an important determinant of, of international capital flows. In the context of uh, demographic change, it has been broadly accepted that households tended to smooth their consumption over time. But the degree of uh, international smoothing is uh, in dispute. So this concerns the degree to which external constraints prevent individuals from smoothing consumption. There are several ways of introducing financial frictions in the literature, including um, borrowing constraint of young individuals and uh, transaction cost of investment in developing economies and uh, introduce uh, confiscation risk of investment in developing or economies. So all those frictions how we explain capital flows from developing countries to advanced economies. All right, most models assume a single commodity good for both consumption uh, and investment as I do in, in, the, in the previous model. So this abstract from the change in consumption uh, composition or abstract from production structure, from the abstract from the real exchange rate, abstract from the term of the trade, so this assumption, some, some point out this assumption is, is a major limitation for, the, for this uh, demographic analysis. And um, demographic transitions can change the economic structure through two channels. On the consumption side, the pattern of consumption across different goods and services can differ across age. So change in the composition of consumption bound over life cycle may be important. Uh, on the production side, as capital and labor intensity can differ or across sectors. So when labor force changes, economic, economic structure can also change. So there are a few, a few studies linking this uh, our production, production, production structure and trade structure to international capital flows. Um, the empirical studies also cover a lot of contents uh, and, uh, and a lot of issues. So I will skip them due to time constraint. Okay, uh, probably I should stop on this uh, conclusion side. I think I have covered uh, all the points here. Yeah, I think I covered all the points here. Uh, just uh, a few words about the future research direction. What, what I uh, think is important is that uh, to compare our different modern, uh, modern approaches and explore, the, uh, explore factor mobilities, particularly for capital mobility and goods mobility. And also demographics, demographic related financial frictions, and also dem demographic driven structure change. And uh, uh, one thing I haven't touched in this uh, in the presentation is about uh, expectations. Um, in, in almost all modern or modern studies, economic agents are always endowed with rational expectations. But some some argue that uh, our economic agents might be completely surprised by changes in demographic trends and pension policies. Or uh, this might be a big challenge to deal with. I don't know. Uh, 
Okay, I will stop here. Thank you, everyone.